All right. So with any luck, we're seeing a big screen saying Kafka disaster recovery and multi-region replication. Certainly can. Lovely. Well, that's the uh, topics we're going to be talking about tonight. Uh, so this is a presentation that was has been previously given by well, one of our other consultants, Steve Dean. So credit to him for creating most of these slides. Uh, these two topics are, kind of, are loosely connected uh, in relation to Kafka, uh, and we'll see how as we go through the slides. So let's start off with disaster recovery, which is, you know, what do you do when things go wrong with Kafka? Now, the first question you might want to ask yourself when thinking about this is, is Kafka good enough as it is? So Kafka itself as an application is designed to be highly available and fault tolerant by itself. So it already has uh, you know, a fair bit of capability to withstand problems. Um, you know, let's talk about some of those features. Uh, so, Michael, I'm, yeah. I, I'm so sorry for interrupting, but there's a few people in the audience tonight. We may not, uh, they, there may be a few beginners or a few newbies in the audience. Maybe you can just get, maybe just like a sort of 30 second or a minute overview of what sort of business problems Kafka actually addresses. That might be useful. Sure. Okay. All right. Well, um, Kafka itself is a, uh, well, they call it a, they, they like to call it a distributed uh, replicated log, which it doesn't tell you anything at all about what it's used for. Uh, so most organizations like to use Kafka as something of a message bus or uh, a streaming data platform. So it's, it's essentially used to ingest and distribute uh, data streams, very, very large data streams, uh, uh, very, very quickly. So, you know, big organizations and most big, or a lot of big organizations use Kafka, uh, use it to, you know, you get sort of in astronomical numbers of, of things like uh, it was originally written at LinkedIn and, but, you know, they say they use it to process billions of messages a day uh, going through Kafka clusters. And the basic idea is you have a cluster of brokers that manage uh, individual messages, uh, which are organized into groups called topics, uh, further subdivided into partitions of topics. And it's you have producers that write information into the cluster and consumers that read information out. Uh, so pretty generic idea, really. Uh, so there's actually a huge, huge range of sort of different uh, problems you could uh, use Kafka for, uh, but it's it's... It's, it's at its best when it's um, being used to decouple uh, you know, data flows from each other so that you can reuse data flows, um, make sure your data flows are being processed reliably. Uh, so it, it, it's infrastructure stuff there. Uh, cool. Thank you. So that sort of actually brings me kind of back to this slide. Uh, let's talk about some of the, the ways in which Kafka is, is designed to be fault tolerant. Uh, so the key thing is, so the most obvious feature is it's data replication. So the idea here is that each topic is, each topic, which is an individual string of messages, uh, is divided into partitions. That's for scalability, not for uh, reliability. And each of those partitions is replicated uh, a certain number of times. So for example, we might set up a topic with a replication factor of three, which means each topic, so each message that gets written into a topic isn't just stored on one broker, it's uh, stored across many brokers in your cluster. So uh, I'm talking about a Kafka cluster. Typically you have uh, a number of brokers running on different machines working together uh, to process your data streams. Why do we do that? Why do we copy the data all, all across different machines? Well, it's to, uh, you know, individual machines can suffer disasters or, you know, crash, be deleted, someone kicks the power cord out. Uh, so we need to be able to withstand that happening uh, without actually losing any overall functionality in our Kafka cluster. Uh, 
so p- part of that is is utilizing some of the rack awareness features uh, so the idea here is rack is a term that gets thrown a lot around a lot when talking about uh, servers in the cloud the idea being that if you have a cluster of servers you want a different one in each rack where rack is a sort of generic idea that represents uh, some kind of fault domain so for example we might have if we're talking about a a cloud service provider they typically have servers arranged into regions such as you know the us europe and then sub regions within that which represent you know maybe different cities in the zone and the idea is you put your individual brokers in different uh, availability zones and therefore you know if power goes out in one city it only takes out one of your nodes so you don't end up losing any functionality of the cluster um, one of the other important sort of uh, reliability features of Kafka is that they have mechanisms for guaranteeing message to the me- guaranteeing message delivery or at the very least making sure you know when a message hasn't been deleted so producers that write messages to Kafka uh, can be set up and often are to only receive acknowledgement when the message has been replicated uh, a sufficient number of times so you can be sure that it's stored safely. And likewise, on the other end, when you have consumer applications reading out of Kafka, uh, they have they cooperate with the Kafka cluster to commit offsets, which basically means talking back to the Kafka cluster to uh, let the cluster know which messages it's definitely processed so that if for whatever reason your consumer dies, uh, it can come back up and the Kafka cluster itself will let it know where it was up to. So there's all sorts of uh, reliability features built into Kafka already. Uh, so when we're talking about disaster recovery, uh, we often we're, you have to sort of draw a distinction between whether you're talking about things going wrong in an individual cluster or what do you do when your whole cluster gets eliminated. But let's talk about individual nodes going down first of all, because that's the most likely thing to happen. I mean, it's it's, it's pretty unlikely to lose an entire cluster all at once, uh, especially if it's scattered across availability zones. So, as I said, there's a bunch of features in there to uh, protect your functionality of the Kafka cluster when a node is going down, but there are still a bunch of things that can go wrong even if you've got all of your topic data safely replicated across uh, brokers. So let's have a look at some of what those are. Okie dokes. So in Kafka, there's this idea of min, minimum in sync replicas. Uh, as I was mentioning before, it's fairly common for producers of messages to Kafka to be configured in a way that says, uh, I only want to receive an acknowledgement once you have confirmed that this message has been replicated three ways or two ways or whatever your number is. And if for the sake of the argument, you've got a a Kafka cluster with three brokers in it and you set this up to say, look, I want to make sure it's my message is replicated on all three brokers and then one of them goes down, well, then you have a problem because your producers can't actually confirm that the message is being written three ways because one of your brokers isn't there. Uh, So in that sort of situation, your Kafka producer will be producing a lot of errors. So some of the things you can do about this is you basically, I mean, obviously the best thing to do is to bring your broker back up and get it working again, Uh, but, some of the other things you can do in the meantime is reduce some of your the strictness of your guarantees. So if you can reduce the topics min in sync, minimum in sync replicas to be a smaller subset of your cluster, uh, that would be a perfectly fine way of going. Or potentially you can reduce the strictness of the producers. So you can tell the producers, look, uh, you can set them up to say, look, I want an acknowledgement when only when the message has been received by at least one broker, 
Or you can even go further and say, I'm just going to send these messages off and hope they arrive. I don't need acknowledgement. Which is not necessarily the way you want to be running all the time, although in some cases you do. But as a stopgap measure, it's not a bad way to, to get around things. Something else that happens uh, that can happen is when you get offline or unbalanced petitions. So topics, as I mentioned before, are divided into petitions, which is basically just allows different brokers to handle different parts of the message stream. And each partition is handled primarily by one of the brokers called the leader of the partition. And if that, if that leader goes down, then the petition becomes offline. And that's a problem because then no one can write and read to it. Uh, the solution, which is pretty much automatically built into Kafka, is that you know, a leader election will occur and one of your other replicates will step up, step up to become the leader of the partition. And therefore, it will carry on the responsibility of handling writes and reads. But as you can imagine, if, an, if a node goes down and all of its leadership of partitions get pushed onto other nodes and then it comes back up again, uh, suddenly you've got a node that's not a leader of any partitions, so it isn't doing as much work as the other brokers. And if this happens in a, you know, in series or in a fairly perverse way, you can end up with some fairly unbalanced workload on your cluster. Uh, as I said, the default settings of Kafka are pretty reliable. This should resolve automatically, uh, but sometimes people turn off the automatic leader election, and so it sort of ends up in this poor state. Uh, if you find this happening in your Kafka cluster, the obvious way to get around it is you can initiate a leader election yourself, a preferred, which will attempt to rebalance, uh, sorry, send the leadership of the partitions back to their original intended leader. Something else that can happen, even in your perfectly well-reliable Kafka cluster, is you, is you give yourself no room for failover. So you can, you can imagine you're throwing so much data at your Kafka cluster that all of your brokers are running at 100% capacity, and one of them goes down, it might safely hand off all of that workload to the other brokers, but they're already running at 100% capacity, so they're not going to be able to handle it. If you find yourself in this situation, uh, producers will start to error, end in latency of your messages getting through to consumers will start to shoot up, uh, and you, you're going to end up in a lot of trouble. Obviously, it's preferable to catch this before it happens. So, you know, if you don't try to run your Kafka clusters at 100% all the time, then you be, won't be in a big problem if one of them dies. But if you do, then you, probably the only thing to do is to slow down or stop your message production temporarily while you bring your brokers back online or, or add new nodes. All right. So let's talk about metrics. So Kafka itself uh, monitors itself quite extensively and puts out a number of metrics about what's going on. Uh, there's lots to look at. Here are some of the things we want to talk about, you know, just watching out for what's happening on your cluster, seeing if things are about to go wrong. So the first of these is being the uh, offline partition count, which I mentioned before. These are partitions that uh, the leader is not available for and so is not handling writes or reads to. Now, ideally, we want this to be zero at all times. Uh, it certainly shouldn't be anything other if it deviates from zero, goes up a little bit because if a, a broker goes down, uh, it shouldn't be staying away from zero. If it's not zero for any particular period of time, you've got a real problem that needs to be addressed. Another one is unclean leader elections. Uh, this is actually off by default, the ability to elect unclean leaders. So the idea here is when a broker goes down and you want one of your other brokers to step up to take the load of that message stream, uh, hopefully the node that's stepping up is, is fully replicated, as in it has all the same information that your leader did before it died. Uh, and if that's the case, 
That's a clean leader election, no problem. If you've got an unclean leader election, it means that Kafka couldn't find any brokers in your cluster that were up to date with the leader. So if you get unclean leader elections, it means you're potentially losing data. And that's bad. So we want that to be unclean leader elections to be zero at all times as well. The other one sort of, this next one, partition to account by broker, is sort of a rule, a rule of thumb that I like to tell people. Uh, we want to have less than about a thousand partitions per broker. Not because anything particularly bad or magic happens at that number. Uh, it's just that every partition you put on a broker comes with its own inherent cost. Uh, and I've, I've seen people go ridiculous with partitions. They say they'll pull up a topic and make give it 5,000 partitions just because uh, you know, they read somewhere that more partitions mean you can have more throughput, which is sort of true in a sense, but obscures the detail that every partition comes with a cost. Uh, you know, I've seen clusters, Kafka clusters, burning 80% of their CPU with no throughput at all just because they had too many partitions on a broker. So, you know, this is a rough rule. Keep it below 1,000 per broker, unless you've got a really, really big machine. Uh, then you can probably handle a few more. Another metric to look out for ISR shrinks and expands. So ISR is the in sync replica set, the, or in other words, the uh, set of brokers which for a particular topic partition uh, are up to date with the leader and fully replicated all of the messages or close enough. And if that's going up and down, if this metrics is going up and down, there's a shrink and expand means I've got brokers going out of that set or going into it. Uh, so if that's not zero, it could mean that brokers are falling behind or there's some general other instability in your cluster. So it probably needs a little bit of attention. Another good one is the request and network handler average idle percentage. So the request and network handler are internal threads within Kafka, which handle obviously processing requests uh, from other Kafka brokers and from producers and from consumers. And if they're you know, not idle, at least some of the time, it means they're always processing, uh, which could be an indicator that you, you're stressing out your cluster and sending too much data at it. So again, a, bit, a little bit arbitrary what I put there. You know, it'd be nice if it was more than 30% idle. And IO weights, actually another good one, not really actually a Kafka metric at all, but something we've learned is, is good to keep an eye on. It's more of a system level metric. If you're looking at your system and you're finding the IO weights beyond 10%, um, this is the time spent, the CPU is spent waiting for syncs to disk, things like that. Uh, usually there shouldn't be much weight at all, uh, in part because Kafka doesn't write to the disk uh, all that often, but if it is waiting that long, then it's, it's having trouble writing to disk and there's probably something going wrong on your broker. All right. So let's, uh, that's a little bit about things that can go wrong and things to watch for. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the other half of this presentation, which is, uh, you know, scaling Kafka worldwide. So this is the multi-region stuff. Michael, just before, I'm sorry for interrupting again, we've got a few questions that have been coming through. Is it okay if I just... Uh, yeah, shoot, yeah, shoot. We'll just deal with, with, with a few of them just now, because there's mm -hmm. a pile. <clears throat> um, so I've got one person that's asking, what's uh, what's the commercial model for Kafka? Is, is it just like an open source thing? Is it, a, is it a licensed thing? Or how does that work? Right, okay. Uh, fair question. So Kafka itself is, uh, a, is an Apache Software Foundation project. So it's a fully open source uh, project, which means that you know anyone can come along. They can download Kafka, set it up, run it themselves, at, you know, obviously at the cost of setting up their own kind of infrastructure. Uh, on top of that, there's a couple of different models of how businesses, you know, use Kafka as a product for, for, for running their business. So for example, InstaCluster offers a managed service where we say, look, we'll, we can, you know, 
sit up and, and run your cluster and provide support and all of that sort of good stuff, uh, obviously at a cost, uh, which you know gives people access to expertise and saves them the trouble of setting up their own infrastructure or learning how to configure it and that sort of thing. So there's services on top of that. It sounds like if, if they badly configure it as well, it's going to it can burn up additional resources on the on the server, which will cost them more in hosting fees as well. So it might make a sense to give you guys a call in the first place. That's absolutely true. Um, these sort of large scale software pieces of software obviously a fairly complex configuration. Uh, you can you can look up the uh, Apache. A Kafka documentation and read all about the different ways you can configure it. Uh, it's a very, very long page that goes through all of the different configuration options. Um, there are other models as well. Uh, some people take the software, add a bit more to it, uh, and then sort of package it, repackage it as a, as a licensed product. Um, but typically, yeah, it, the, the internal part of it is, is open source, but it's sort of additions to it or services on top of it that get you know, charged by companies who are looking to, to run it as a business. Okay. Does that answer the question? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. So we've got, we've got another one from Saju. Mm -hmm. um, is asking, partition count per broker, mm -hmm. how can we calculate with respect to CPU core or memory availability on an instance? How do you calculate the partition count? Partition count per broker. I'm just wondering, Saju, uh, you can request the microphone if you like from that end. Uh, if you'd like to to speak about this, I'm just reading it uh, up on the questions just now. Partition count per broker. How can we calculate with respect to CPU CPU core or memory available on an instance? Does that make sense, or you need a bit more clarification from Saju? Uh, I, I can have a go uh, at answering that, and if I get it wrong, then, then we'll ask for more clarification. Awesome. Sounds good. Deal. Far away. Okay. <laughs> yeah, hi. Uh, can you hear so, me? Y yes, we can. Yeah, yeah. So my question was like, uh, so basically, um, let's say we have uh, a number of uh, uh, topics, and we have to um, like... Uh, 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 like uh, creating a Kafka cluster, it's re related to the number of broker and uh, uh, and uh, the topics. How we can calculate that count? Actually, that's what my question. So you are uh, in the slide. You were mentioned like a partition count uh, per broker. It should be uh, below thousand. Mm -hmm. The previous. Yeah, okay. oh, oh yeah, my query is on that actually. Yeah. Okay. So mm -hmm. your Kafka cluster is going to have a number of topics, each of those topics is going to have its own number of partitions, and each of those partitions is going to have its own set of replicas. Okay. So if we have, uh, you know, 50 topics, uh, each topic has 10 partitions, and a replication factor of 3, okay. that's 50 by 10 by 3, which is 1,500 partitions total, okay. and if that's spread across three brokers, then chances are, if it's all sort of evenly done, uh, you'll have about 500 partitions per broker. Yeah. Uh, having said that, uh, sometimes like this, it doesn't force you to be even. You can set these things up to be uneven, so you can have some brokers with more partitions than others. Um, obviously, I wouldn't recommend that. Nice to keep things balanced. But that's sort of like a rough way you, you figure it out. The other thing is you can actually just look directly um, Kafka tools, the command line tools will tell you exactly where every replica of every partition is. Uh, so you could count this more than giving a rough estimate. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, I got it. So uh, actually, uh, just to uh, uh, my question again, like uh, um, let's say like uh, you told that 500 partition uh, uh, that would be different, right? Like uh, the three broker which we have is, uh, if it is a, a let's say in AWS, we have a, a different instance type. So uh, the instance is the with the, um, let's say eight, uh, 16 core and uh, uh, 32 MB RAM, or uh, and uh, if it is a, um, a 32 core CPU and uh, uh, 64 MB RAM. So the instance is different in the both cases. So in that case, like uh, we can, um, the um, 
partition the work we can um, give to the instance would be a different so in that correlation uh, can we calculate the uh, broker size or something yeah so if i'm hearing the question correctly it's like you know i've got different sizes of things so what's an appropriate partition count for each thing um yeah so look it's a, it's a rough rule of thumb i'm not saying that you know this size can handle this many partitions because it, it, it's it's just not that simple unfortunately okay. uh, how much each broker can handle is is going to be dependent on a lot more than just the number of partitions uh, it's going to relate to your workload and what sort of messages you're putting through and what sort of behavior your producers and consumers are, are doing. Okay. Uh, I'm putting that in more as a kind of reminder to, to remind people that uh, your brokers can't handle an infinite number of partitions. Okay. So if you've got performance problems and you look at it and say, oh, I've got 3,000 partitions on this broker, uh, maybe that's something you should be looking at first. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like this is a good argument for getting uh, good, good monitoring set up to be able to monitor the, the health and well-being of your cluster. Absolutely. Uh, we can you know, infer and, and what might happen if you do a particular setup, but uh, there's nothing better than getting data on what's actually happening in your real setup. But does, it, does the actual application Kafka come with uh, good, good enough monitoring? Or do they just say, hey, no, we do Kafka, uh, but we do enable, like, a if it's a Java application, like a JMX interface, and you can hook into whatever metrics logging tool you want, like Prometheus or whatever. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it does provide an enormous range of JMX metrics, okay. uh, which you can look at, and they all mean something slightly different and interesting. Uh, part of the reason I was talking about the, uh, the last slide about the some of those metrics is because you know these these are some of the good metrics to look at when you to to see if your cluster is about to die or not. Um, but there is a whole range of them, uh, and monitoring them, like you said, there's there's lots of tools that can help you. Uh, you know, Prometheus, Datadog. Um, you know, in cluster we have some of our own tools on the cluster to do monitoring, and provide you with a wealth of information about what's going on on your cluster. Awesome. There are there are another three or four more questions, but I should probably let you get back to your talk, and then we'll, we'll cycle around. So when you pause for breath, ask me for some more questions. <laughs> sure. Okay, dokes. <laughs> All right. So we're talking here about uh, you know when you need to expand your cluster across the world. You know, here's a nice little picture of the world showing that. All right. So why why would you do this thing? Why would you do it? Well, there's a bunch of reasons. The obvious and most connected one with the previous part of this talk is disaster recovery. If by some horrible chance you do lose an entire cluster because it's all within one geographical region and something really bad happens, you might want to have a backup cluster somewhere else that you can go to uh, to can make sure that your whatever your business is can, can continue. But that's not the only reason. There's a bunch of other reasons, some of which are listed on this slide. Geoproximity is another common one. So this is the idea that, you know, if I'm producing and consuming from a cluster, uh, I don't necessarily want to stretch across the internet to do that. Uh, it, maybe it's, it's just more, you know, maybe my applications are just going to work better if I'm communicating with something locally. Uh, but I still want to have access to information generated across the globe. So you generate it in one cluster, ship it across to a different cluster in a different region of the world, and then maybe we've got consumers in that different region who can consume from it. Uh, some of the other reasons, legal and compliance. Uh, there might be policy reasons within your organization for where information should be stored or, or something like that. Um, cloud migration is another one. Uh, there's a bunch of organizations at the moment who are kind of in this state of moving between, you know, an on-premises data strategy with a cloud-based data strategy, and they might want to move data to the cloud back and forth while they figure out what their strategy is going to be. And of course, analytics. So if you need to analyze a bunch of data that's generated in different locations around the world, 
you might need to replicate it all to one location so you can perform holistic analytics. And likewise, you might want to send the results of data back and deploy it back out to your other locations. So there's lots of reasons to, to try and do it. So what are some of the common methods? Well, Mirror Maker is something I'm going to talk about you know, a fair bit in this presentation. Most of it's about Mirror Maker, to be perfectly honest. Um, so Mirror Maker 1 is this solution that went, was created with one of the early versions of Kafka. It's pretty simple. It's been around forever. Uh, and it's kind of been the de facto for a while. Um, there are other solutions. Some people like to try and set up what they call stretch clusters, which is rather than having a different cluster in a different region, they try and put different brokers in the same logical cluster in different regions, which works up until a point. Uh, well, typically, the number I've heard sort of bandied around is that if you can get less than 100 milliseconds latency between your brokers, then that's OK. That'll work. That's only going to stretch so far. You know, Maybe a few different data centers around the city might work. Uh, but once you're stretching across continents, that's not going to work anymore. And it's just the internal protocols in Kafka. You're kind of violating their assumptions once you stretch things that far away, and so they just don't work as expected. I'm not going to talk too much more about stretch clusters because we generally recommend against it. Uh, custom or vendor solutions, uh, where you basically coming up with your own solution on how to do this. Uh, there's a couple of examples of that, which I'll touch on briefly. And of course, Mirror Maker 2, which is uh, you know, a reimagining of Mirror Maker, you know, a more modern version that's going into the uh, open source project uh, as we speak. Okay, dokes. So Did you know, Michael, that you're so brilliant you actually answered somebody's question that they just posed on Mirror Did I? That was I'm cool. It's like you can see the future. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to say, what makes Kafka's Mirror Maker awesome? And when, and when it may it not be appropriate? That was more the tail end of the question. You got any thoughts on that one? When, when, what makes it awesome? Or, well, I'm going to go into what makes it awesome and what makes it not awesome in the next couple of days. Shut up and let you get on with it. <laughs> <laughs> um, the next part about when it's not appropriate, it's probably not in the slides, but we'll, we'll have a look at it. Awesome. Thank you. Let's get to the slides first. Okay, so Mirror Maker 1. All right, so this was actually, a Mirror Maker is a very grandiose name for this uh, because it's pretty much the simplest thing you could possibly imagine, which is, a consumer paired with a producer that reads from one Kafka cluster and writes all of that data into the next cluster. Makes sense, right? That's what I want to do, replicate the data. OK, fine. Makes sense. Has a few little limitations when you get into thinking about the detail of it, uh, which are a few of which are on this slide. So fairly limited disaster recovery support. And what I mean by that is, as I mentioned, I think in my first or second slide, part of the guarantees that uh, Kafka provides is that if you're a consumer, uh, you can coordinate with your Kafka cluster to work out where in your message stream, where in your data stream you're up to. Uh, and this is done through the process of committing offsets back to the Kafka cluster. If you've uh, just used Mirror Maker to write your data to some other cluster, uh, if you actually need to switch your consumer from one cluster to another because your first cluster has died, it doesn't have any record in the other cluster of where it was up to. So unless you've got a very smart consumer that can figure out where it was up to on its own, you've got a bit of a problem. Um, the other thing is topics are, are more than just a name. They have properties. There are things about them. There's, you know, there's a number of partitions. There's uh, a whole range of config properties that get applied to topics like uh, retention periods and, and that sort of thing. Uh, if Mirror Maker One sort of didn't really do much in this 
in this area. So it was pretty easy to end up in a situation where, you know, your topic in your destination cluster didn't really match the config of your topic in your source cluster, um, which kind of could be a problem or might not be, but could be a problem with your uh, if you're expecting something to be, you know, the same. Uh, so manual topic naming to avoid cycles. So one of the things, one of the sort of setups you might want to try with Mirror Maker is having, a, you know, what we call an active-active cluster where, you know, information from two clusters are replicated into each other. Uh, Mirror Maker 1 wasn't especially good at that, and you could easily get yourself into situations where you're mirroring from the topic in one cluster to a different cluster and then back into the first cluster and then into the second cluster again and then back into the first cluster again. Uh, you know, in this sort of loop, which would create a message storm and basically destroy your clusters. Uh, so the lack of exactly once guarantees is kind of what I was talking about before, about, uh, you know, consumer offsets going missing. The way it was configured, you have configurations in Mirror Maker to specify which topics you're going to replicate, which is fine, but if you needed to change them, you kind of had to restart Mirror Maker and in doing so, you introduced a break in your message processing, so you, which could end up with putting back pressure on things and uh, could cause, cause problems in other systems. And of course, as a regular Kafka consumer, you, you do have to deal with some of the scalability and throughput limitations that occur when you have rebalances, although that's not particularly unique to Mirror Maker, that's just true of any consumer application. Uh, so, I mean, I spoke about it a lot. Translating offsets is important. That is, you know, if you're doing this for a disaster recovery point of view, you want to know that, you know, where you're up to in your source cluster and where you're up to in your destination cluster are uh, comparable. And you might say, hey, Michael, what are you talking about? Like, if I've got a message at offset three in the source cluster, won't it also be at offset three in the destination cluster? To which the answer is, no, it may not be for all sorts of reasons. Um, you know, Kafka is a data stream and doesn't keep every message forever. So when you start mirroring a cluster, uh, you know, you, you might be starting at offset 73 in the source and that'll become offset one in the destination. So, uh, you know, it isn't going to match up in necessarily the way you expect. All right, so what do you do about it? Fair enough, what do you do? Uh, well, you could roll your own solution that tries to track offsets. Fair enough. Um, there are vendor alternatives. Uh, you know, plenty of different organizations have, this is not a new problem, plenty of organizations have encountered this and written their own things. I'll be touching briefly on Uber's new replicator, uh, which was one way of doing this. Uh, and Mirror Maker 2, of course, which I'll talk about a bit later on, also has its own way of doing this. Uh, I might stop for brush the questions there if any have come in. Yeah, um, we've got a we've got a couple of questions from uh, Yihan. Yeah. Uh, so, Mike, what do you think of the cluster the clustering linking feature in the latest version of the Confluent platform? Is that a good solution for DR multi region replication? Yeah. Right. Um, so. Confluent has obviously is a big player in this space and and, and has, a, has a lot of good solutions to some of these problems. Um, in particular, some of the things like the cluster linking, the, the, the observer nodes in, in, in Confluent uh, try to get around some of the limitations in the basic open source Kafka by uh, you know having a more sophisticated thing. Uh, so yeah, look, they tend to be reasonably good alternatives. Um, there, there's certainly another way of doing things. It's, it is, it does tend to be a proprietary solution, so it doesn't have the benefits of, of open source. So that's probably its main downside. But as a technical solution, they, they tend to be pretty good. Uh, so it's definitely one way you can go. So, you know, Confluent, for example, has its own replicator product as well. Uh, which is, you know, another way to go. 
So there's, there's sort of lots of solutions in that space if, if you're going into the into the confluent road. Many ways to skin a cat. So there's mm. there's another question. Um, is there a way to make the DR process opaque to the clients, meaning the clients won't need to change their configuration to connect to a new cluster during failover and failback? Gee, that's a great question. Typically, the solutions here don't do that. Uh, and the reason is the consumers in Kafka tend to be quite sort of smart in the way they operate. So you give them a bootstrap server, uh, they go and query the cluster itself about what its topology is, and then it brings back all the places it needs to go to to write and read from. Now, when you're switching clusters because of an entire cluster failover, uh, obviously that whole process needs to be reset. That's actually a lot easier in if your failure is, is located within a cluster. So it, it is fairly, tr it's completely transparent, more or less, if you're, you know, if, if a node dies in a cluster and you have to switch between them. But switching between clusters entirely, you're kind of breaking that model. So uh, some people use that as a reason for, you know, wanting to do a stretch cluster uh, where you've got brokers in different regions, but they're part of logically the same thing. Uh, but basically, most of these solutions don't do that. Uh, the client does need to be sort of smart enough to know how to go to a different cluster. That's probably not the answer you wanted to hear. Oh, good. There's still another couple of questions, but I'll probably just keep them so and let you get back on with your talk. Otherwise, we'll be here all night. <laughs> Very good. All right. So, um, okay. All right, let's, let's pick up the pace a little bit. Okay, this is just a basic example that to sort of further explain what I'm talking about. One approach is to create a cost and switch over library and store your own offsets. So how does that work? Well, you have a client that's connecting to a primary data center. Okay, fine. You have to write your own offset man management utility that you know, writes that information somewhere uh, into a primary, into a secondary, sort of translating your own offsets as you go. So that when a client finds that the primary data center isn't there anymore, it can head off and start talking to the secondary data center and pull its own offsets from there. That's kind of rolling your own, which is basically what NewMaker 2 has already done. It's what all the vendors' uh, solutions have done. You could do it yourself or you could just use one of them. So Uber's U replicator. I'm not going to talk a whole, whole heap about this because I'm definitely not an expert on this at all. Uh, but I just wanted to, wanted to give a flavor for some of the more complicated products out there. So this product is uh, actually based on a different Apache product uh, product called Helix, which is a generic cluster management tool. And what this does is it uses Helix to create its own set of replicator workers and it uses that sort of generic cluster management technology to make adding and deleting topics very easy, adding and deleting nodes very easy. There's no need to restart things. Uh, basically trying to get all of, over all of those limitations in Neuromaker 1. Uh, and it kind of you know, going to a sort of more basic level rather than using some of Kafka's inbuilt group management and subscription processes Kind of replaces it with its own version where it manages its own uh, assigning of replicator workers to partitions, and so it's 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 you know perfectly good product. Obviously, it's a it's a, it's a complicated thing, uh, and I can't talk too much on it because I'm not an expert. But as I said, uh, you know some organisations have gone to a lot of effort to try and work out this mirroring problem. And if it's useful for your use case, you may want to use one of these, these tools. All right, Mirror Maker 2. So this is the next iteration. Uh, why I give this prominence is because it is actually part of the Apache project. It's fully open source. It's not bound to a particular vendor. It's not behind some sort of proprietary license that you need. 
So it's going to be, should really be your starting point for this sort of thing. So this is, you know, another tool. It's designed to address the limitations of Mirror Maker 1. Uh, it's based on Kafka Connect. Uh, so for those who don't know, Kafka Connect is, again, part of the open source project. It's part, it's a framework for moving data in and out of Kafka to other sources. So, you know, it could be databases, other streaming platforms, storage solutions. Uh, and Mirror Maker 2, based on that framework, uh, in this case, it's moving from Kafka to Kafka, but that's fine. And that framework has a lot of benefits itself, which I'm sure I'm not going to go into too much detail to because that's its whole other topic. Uh, okay, so Mirror Maker 2 includes a bunch of Kafka Connect uh, elements. Uh, it can run in two different modes. You can run it in its own kind of dedicated mode where it has its own uh, driver to drive the Kafka connectors, or you can create you can just put the Mirror Maker 2 connectors directly onto a Kafka Connect cluster and run them yourself. Uh, and it has all it's been you know it has all the nice features that uh, you know get around some of the limitations of Mirror Maker 1. So it'll detect new topics and partitions. Uh, one of the interesting things it does is uh, uses admin clients, which is part of the internal uh, Kafka client API. It has a couple of these in place, which it uses to uh, keep the topic configurations in sync between clusters so that, you know, you've got the same configs on your destination and your source. Uh, it's it's designed from the ground up to support those sort of active-active configurations that I touched on briefly before, where you've got uh, data replicating back both ways between two sets of clusters. Uh, and it's, you know, pretty flexible in the in the topologies it can support. And of course, it has a solution for uh, translating offsets. So as it replicates topics, it also reads consumer offsets, which is an internal Kafka topic, and works out translations and puts those into the destination cluster so that uh, consumers can pick those up and read them if they need to switch into the new cluster. Uh, at the moment, it's a bit it's not as it's not as you know well developed as its aspiration uh, is some of the stuff that Moon Maker 2 promises actually isn't quite implemented yet uh, certainly the while the offset translation is there uh, one of the ongoing improvements to Moon Maker 2 that's happening at the moment is is making the making those offsets available in a way that is transparent to the consumer which will make things easier. Going back to that previous question that we had, that I don't think I answered satisfactorily, uh, <laughs> which was, you know, can we make this process seamless? Not totally seamless at the way at the moment, but improvements are going in to make, you know, at least reading the translated offsets seamless, even if you have to uh, switch which cluster you're talking to manually. All right, so. This is sort of its the default way it works. So Mirror Maker 2, when it's replicating uh, topic partitions, uh, it'll do some renaming. It'll, it'll give topics in the mirrored cluster uh, a prefix which represent where it came from. We call these aliases, source aliases, target aliases. And the reason it does this is, is basically to in one to avoid loops where you're sort of replicating things backwards and forwards. So you can see in this in this diagram we've got the same thing, topic number one being replicated both ways, but in order to avoid those loops and polluting topics with messages in the other cluster, we give them their own kind of namespace in which to sit. Uh, and that allows not only the prevention of those loops, but you know, a little bit sort of smarter detection from Mirror Maker as to which topics need to be replicated and which ones are actually already replicas. And these can chain, by the way. So if you replicate A to B and B to C and C to D, you can end up with a quite a long topic name. Okie doke. 
So as I said, the connector, the Mirror Maker 2 uses the connector framework, which means it's implemented as, in, at least in part, as a bunch of connectors. So according to the aspiration, we have, so connectors in general, we have two sorts. We have source connectors and sync connectors. Source connectors are supposed to take things from data from an outside source and feed them into Kafka. Sync connectors take information out of Kafka and feed them into an outside source. Since we're going from Kafka to Kafka, you could probably use either. Uh, Mirror Maker 2 certainly aspires to have both. Uh, at the moment, I think in the, uh, in the released versions of Kafka, uh, the sync connector isn't actually there. So you only have the source connector, but you know, it's coming, it's coming. So the source connector is what actually does the replication of the, the data, but you also have a bunch of uh, supporting connectors. So the checkpoint connector is a connector that emits the consumer checkpoints. It's doing the translation process I was talking about before. And then you have another one called the heartbeat connector, which just sort of puts out data occasionally and is, is intended to be used as a kind of check to see if your mirroring is happening at all. Uh, okay, so this is basically just a, a diagram showing a little bit about uh, how those parts fit together. So the idea is, you know, the mirror source connector gets divided up into workers. This is sort of something, this is not something specific to Mirror Maker. This is how all Kafka connectors work. Uh, and but what Mirror Maker does is in addition to having some, so it has these admin clients which do the topic uh, configuration syncing, and they'll have a consumer which reaches the source topic, and they pass things on to the Kafka Connect framework, which handles the uh, production of messages into Kafka. And you can get sort of complex topologies uh, coming out of this. So this diagram is again is a bit aspirational because you have many clusters going into one cluster, which is what you do with source connectors, and one cluster going into many clusters, which is what you do with sync connectors. As I said, only the source connectors there at the moment. Uh, but you can still have, uh, because it's Kafka or Kafka, you can implement all the same complexity using uh, source connectors both ways. So typically how you would do that is, the recommendation is always that you should put producers close to the cluster they're producing to. Consumers can be far away, but producers should be close. So if you're doing a mirror maker uh, replication setup, typically what happens, this diagram is way more complicated, looks way more complicated than it is. Basically all it's saying is you have, you know, a mirror maker cluster in each data center where you want to ship data to, and that mirror maker cluster will handle pulling data from all of your other data centers and into your local one. And it's pretty easy to set up. It's pretty easy to set up. Uh, Mirror Maker 2. Uh, this is a, an example config. There isn't much to it. You give it a name. Uh, you give it a maximum number of tasks, which is just the sort of degree of parallelism in your replication. You tell which topics you want to uh, replicate. Uh, you do have to specify key and value converters, which uh, you know, matters more if you're interested in doing, you know, schema transformations and schema aware messages. Uh, if you're not, you can just use, treat everything as blobs of byte arrays. And then you just say, look, give your source cluster an alias, tell it where to find it. Give your target cluster an alias, tell it where to find it. You can optionally put in, you know, any of the other Kafka consumer client properties if you want or produce properties. And uh, you can spin it up. And this is a sort of an example configuration for using the dedicated standalone mode. Or if you're trying to run these on a on Kafka Connect directly, not much different. You just send the configuration to the Kafka Connect REST API. Looks kind of the same. Um, slightly more complex because you kind of have to set up your connectors yourself. Whereas the standalone mode kind of manages which connectors to set up for you. But otherwise, it's, it's pretty simple to set one of these things up and, and have it running. Uh, so that's all I had in my discussions today. So if we have more questions, it would be a great time for them.
Uh, yeah, there's another couple of questions that I've got here, uh, Mike. Great. So we've got somebody asking, let me just read through here, see if I can sort of paraphrase. Um, it's like essentially they're asking um, when you set up replication, disaster recovery stuff, you must have made some mistakes <laughs> along the way. And we're asking for you to spill the beans here, just to stop. You've got a few scars, and we want to try and avoid people in the audience getting some scars as well. Are there any things that, like, it's a bit of a sort of gotcha, like some obvious ones that spring to mind? Yeah, well, I mean, some obvious one, sort of dumb moments. Different advice yeah. is worth millions, by the way, that's coming up now. <laughs> Go on. Yeah. Uh, so... Here's one. So you set, you're setting up like an active active cluster. Yep. And in order to do so, obviously we're using topic renaming and just, you know, not setting our consumers to read from the replicated topics from the other source because, you know, we forgot to actually put names on them. It's like, you know, the obvious things, but, you know, left to scratching our heads still with what was actually why we weren't getting a bunch of messages. Um, the other thing I'd say is, is, is probably doing it when you don't need to. Um, this is sort of more like a forced scar than something else. We've had, we've had people sort of say, look, we want to back this up because, you know, data backup's a good thing, right? Usually. Safe, makes you feel safe, right? But I think some people forget that Kafka is pretty reliable just by itself. Uh, and if you're sort of setting up your cluster not in just the one location, uh, you know, you've got a fair amount of backup already. So barring any sort of horrible bugs in Kafka where it destroys all of your data, which unfortunately I have seen, um, it's pretty reliable most of the time. Very unusual situation that right? cause it to lose data. Um, what else? What else have we stuffed up? We've got another we've got mm. question whilst you're pondering that one. <laughs> um, I'm just asking, what are the limitations of um, open source Kafka, if that's appropriate? What are the limitations of an open source Kafka? Yeah, or is it like a fully, it, it's a fully fledged product and you can make up all the mistakes you want? I presume that's sort of asked in reference to like a non-open source version, like a, a an extended version like Confluence. And I'm guessing that's what the intent of the question is. Um, so yeah, Kafka is a, a, a fully working product. There's, there's no, there's nothing, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. It works. You know, it's fully the fully open source version. You can set it up. You can run it on our platform or your own, or anyone else's. You can stream huge amounts of data to it. It's not really limited in that sense. Uh, some of the proprietary solutions built on top of it obviously add more features. Uh, I guess I wouldn't really describe that as a limitation of Kafka so much as it is the value add that those other businesses are trying to add on top of it. OK. Uh, cool. So we've got another question uh, from uh, Saju. Yeah. So he's saying, so all, all the methods we've discussed are about keeping separate Kafka, uh, Kafka cluster to keep the data. Mm -hmm. How about if we create a topic with a multiple number of replicas, make mm -hmm. the replicas spread around multiple AZs? Can we discuss mm -hmm. the pros and cons of that, of that approach? Uh, well, that's basically uh, keeping it within the one cluster. Uh, and that's a much better solution if you can do it, <laughs> frankly. Uh, and that's that's essentially what the inbuilt replication in Kafka is for. So, you know, let's say you've got three AZs, uh, you put a broker in each one, uh, you replicate your topic three ways, uh, you lose you lose a broker, you know, one of the other brokers will step up as the leader for any partitions that weren't there. Uh, your consumers will seamlessly switch over because it's all part of the normal Kafka protocols, uh, and that's, that's much better. Uh, 
this mirroring stuff that I'm talking about is, is really more for when you have to go further than you can do with one cluster. So not just different AZs within the one region, but around the globe. Because Kafka doesn't operate that well around the globe if you try and put stretch a cluster that far. You know, notwithstanding some of the uh, other kind of more advanced solutions that are out there now with follower nodes and that sort of thing. Cool. Uh, I think that's I think that's about it from the questions. And I know that uh, we're we're fifteen minutes over. There were so many questions coming in there. That was awesome. So I think um, I think it only it only remains for me to say th thank you very much indeed. And thank you, Buster, to Michael. Clearly, this is not your first time you've talked about Kafka. <laughs> 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 you may very well have played with it fairly extensively, I'm guessing. <laughs> yeah, so just on behalf of um, all of the um, all of the attendees tonight and um, Amanda and myself, thank you very, very much uh, for you guys giving up your time to share some of uh, your invaluable experience. So I think it's, it's made it pretty clear that if you've got any, if you're planning any um, sort of large-scale Kafka installs, uh, or you've actually got some large-scale Kafka installs, then um, Instacluster is probably um, a telephone number you probably want to make sure that's in your mobile somewhere. So, yeah, just sort of wrapping up, um, I think 